Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Chris. Welcome back to Cheetash, where we are on pages 53 through 70 of The Alchemist by Paulo Soelo. If you guys remember pages, uh, starting on page 50, that was the end of part one. Page 53, we start part two. And before we begin, let's just kind of go over what really happened in part one. All right, so we were, we, we've been introduced to a couple different characters, but we know that Santiago's the main guy. He's the boy, he's the shepherd, he's got a flock of sheep, travels around. We know that he, uh, this is like Andalus, Andalusia of Spain, um, speaks Spanish, uh, he's from a small village. His parents wanted him to go into clergy, into the church, be a priest. He kind of decided against it. He wanted to go travel. Uh, the family, though, doesn't have a whole lot of money. The dad ends up giving him some money to go start his first flock. He travels around with his flock. He goes to a merchant frequently. I think it was like a year. On a yearly basis, gets a sheep sheared. That's how he gets paid. The merchant has a daughter who... it. It really seems like Santiago has taken a liking to. And he he describes like he can't wait to get back there to see the merchant's daughter again. But what happens? He meets up with this old woman. He's been having some weird dreams. The woman's a gypsy. She can interpret dreams. So he goes to the woman to have his dream interpreted and she tells him oh your your dream means that there is a treasure at the pyramids you and i want 10 percent of that or i uh, or i think it was 10 percent. and so santiago's like to hell with this he later he he meets an old man he kind of the salem king the, the he kind of tells him something similar um, he ends up in Africa now. He gets his sheep stolen from him by the newcomer is what I kind of called him. Um, but yeah, now, now he is in Africa. He meets this crystal merchant. He wants to buy his, buy some sheep. He seems like he wants to return home. And just kind of go back to the shepherding thing. Maybe just leave this whole nonsense with the personal legend, the treasure at the pyramids. Leave that all behind. Let's see what happens. Starting here. On page 53. In a month has gone by. That's kind of where this starts. Like a month later than where we ended at part one where the merchant, uh, the crystal merchant has just hired him on. And he's been working there for a month. I would think he's probably liked it. Whoops. I would think he's probably liked it. I mean, he's he's made it a month. Uh, and it's it's saying here that, you know, he's been, the, the merchant's been doing a lot better. A lot better. The, and the boy has seemed to have brought good fortune to the merchant. Remember, the merchant said that, you know, his shop, it's on the top of the hill. He used to host, like, a lot of big names up there. It seems like he used to be busy. Now, you know, just before Santiago came, it seemed like, well, he he doesn't get the same business that he did. Now that Santiago's there, he's kind of been hustling and bustling around. He's been making a good commission uh, that he'll mention in like a few pages here. And the boy has kind of been a good omen for the merchant in a way. And Santiago seems like he should just go into sales. It seems like the shop is doing really well. Right here on page 53, he goes to make a a suggestion 
for the shop. He says, I want to d build a display case for the crystal. And the merchant initially refuses on the grounds that, you know, people are going to pass by, people are going to bump into it. I don't want to have to clean up this mess sort of thing. And Santiago says something interesting. Well, when I took my sheep through the fields, some of them might have died if we had come upon a snake, but that's the way of life when you're with sheep and with shepherds. So it's kind of just the cost of doing business. You got to take risks. Take the good with the bad. You take the risks to make the sale. And if it doesn't end up working out, it doesn't end up working out. But you're not going to make any real money unless you take those risks. I don't know really if that's what Paulo, the author, is saying through this little story. But that's just kind of what what's running through my head a little bit right now. Um, you got to risk it to get the biscuit. And if that means you got to... Be willing to lose some glass by people bumping into your new display, but that display is going to sell a lot of glass. Maybe you got to do it if that's what you want. Let's continue on. Uh, the boy says business has really improved. Um, I'm doing much, or this is uh, the merchant, I'm, I'm doing much better. And soon you'll be able to return to your sheep. Why ask more out of life? Hmm. And Santiago replies, because we have to respond to the omens. The principle, and he brings this up again, the principle of favorability, beginner's luck. <laughs> because life wants you to achieve your personal legend. So he's been there a month. He wants to just, I think Santiago wants to keep riding this beginner's luck. Let's build this display case. Let's sell more. He wants the money so he can get the sheep. And so he's motivated to just get that, get, get the hell out of there as fast as he can. Get back home. How is he going to do that? He's got to sell a lot more. So he's saying here, let's ride the omen. Let's ride the beginner's luck that we're having here, the principle of favorability, so I can get home faster. And the merchant, I think, kind of picks up on it a little bit. Um, you know, it's strange. Santiago never really told the merchant about why he wanted to go to the pyramids. He, and I don't really even know if he wants to go there anymore. I mean, it seems like he's focused on the sheep to get back uh, back to Spain, get out of Africa. So that that's just kind of interesting. Um, you know, the merchant brings this up and says, well, I don't know why you want to go there. They're just a pile of stones. Um, the boy brings up, well, you've never had dreams of travel? And the guy says, the merchant uh, says, well, I don't really like change that much. Um, he kind of... And in, in when Santiago says this, you've never had dreams of travel, he kind of like ignores the question. And I think what we're going to see here is the merchant had dreams of his own and maybe has his personal legend, but he doesn't pursue it anymore. So that's why maybe he ignored this question of you've never had dreams of travel. And then he says, I don't like change much, which may be, is the reason why he doesn't want the display case. Let's continue on. Da, 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 da. Principle of favorability, beginner's luck. Here's where uh, this slide comes in, the five obligations. The five obligations come from the Quran, and obviously he's in Africa. Uh, the merchant is Muslim, Arabic. Most people in this area of Africa are mu uh, Muslim. And... The crystal merchant says the most important, there are just five obligations to satisfy during our lives. Most important is to believe only in the one true God. And then the others pray five times a day, fast during Ramadan, be charitable to the poor, which is what the merchant was charitable to Santiago, giving him, buying him lunch that day, hiring him in 
to his shop. And then this is where he begins to get a little choked up because he says the fifth obligation is you got to take the pilgrimage to Mecca. So this is kind of why he kind of ignored Santiago's question of, do you like to travel? Because he needs to travel to get to Mecca. It's further than the pyramids are, he says. A lot further than the pyramids are. This is on page 56. But he doesn't want to go there. Because the thought of Mecca... Here, I think I wrote this on the last slide. Yes, okay, right here at the bottom. The thought of Mecca keeps him alive. So that ever never-ending pursuit of it gets him up every day, gets him working. If his dream is realized, then what does he have to live for? That's his thinking here. Which I kind of completely disagree with. Like, it, I would tell the crystal merchant, shoot, go get that dream, go to Mecca, and then you move on to something else. You have that to hold on to for the rest of your life. Now, you, let's. what's another pilgrimage you can do, or what's another challenge that you can overcome, a carrot that you can chase? You know, it doesn't just stop there. I, I don't, it seems kind of short-sighted to me. Uh, that the crystal merchant would think about it like this. Let's continue. And here's where the next slide, two months. Now there's like this little page break and then two months pass. And it's saying here the display slash shelf that they, uh, that they did. Not a lot of people bumped into it, it seems like. Not a lot of broken glass, just a lot of, a lot of sales. Um, it's it's said here that um, he's Santiago's made a lot of money. Um, he could, in about six months, he estimates that he could buy sixty sheep. He could return to Spain. He could buy another sixty. He could have a hundred twenty sheep. Wow, that's a lot of sheep. And he he's picked up his Arabic. He's starting to kind of appreciate, I think, this foreign land. And he kind of says it um, that, you know, this place is no longer a strange place. When he first got there, it was strange because he had, didn't have the familiarity with it. But now that he's growing accustomed to it, he's learned Arabic, he's been working there, he's just more used to it. It's no longer strange for him. It's, it's almost like he doesn't fear it or he's not intimidated by it is maybe a better word Um to, de to describe his feelings towards Africa so far. Let's continue on. The boy now, Santiago has another idea. All right, so the shelf worked out. Lots of things have worked out. They're writing this beginner's luck, and now Santiago wants to sell tea. And he says on page 58, let's sell tea to the people who climb the hill. Not a bad, de bad idea. You, I mean, the hill might be pretty big. They might get pretty parched. Why not at the top of the hill offer something to quench their thirst? And again, the crystal merchant kind of has mixed feelings about it. He doesn't necessarily want to do it. He doesn't like new things. He it seems like he just likes things as they are. He doesn't want change. He's at a point of his life that he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to have to deal with change anymore. And I get it. It's hard. Change can be hard to to adjust to that and get reoriented. But the boy's got the idea to sell the tea and the crystal glass that way. We're making money off the tea, and then they're more inclined maybe to buy the crystal glass. Beauty is the great seducer of men, is what Santiago says. So the beauty of the glass that they're drinking out of could push sales as well. 
So the later on, they have a smoke out of the hookah. And the merchant asks Santiago, what is it you are looking for? And Santiago says, well, I need, I've already told you before, I need my sheep. I got to get back home. I got to earn money to buy the sheep. And he exclaims to Santiago, man, if I start selling tea, I'll have to change my way of life. Well, isn't that good, Santiago says. I'm already used to the way things are. See, this is kind of what I was saying earlier. Before you came, I was thinking about how much time I had wasted in the same place while my friends had moved on and either went bankrupt or did better than they had before. Made them depressed. So it's almost kind of like, well, why bother? I'm not going to make it like they did. Or I might fail, end up doing being worse, so I'm just going to stay put. I'm not going to change anything. Why bother? Shop's exactly the same. Right here, page 60, shop is exactly the size I always wanted it to be. I don't want to change anything because I don't know how to deal with change. I'm used to the way I am. But then it seems like he, you know, oops, let's not go to that slide yet. Uh he he really is truly thankful, I think, of Santiago. Santiago's helped him a lot. The, the store's been busy. You know, they're, he's driving sales. It seems like they're doing very well. And, but the, the fact is he still doesn't really want to change. Santiago is showing the merchant, as it says here on page 60, you're forcing me to look at wealth and her horizons I had never known. And now that I see how immense my possibilities are, I'm going to feel worse than I did before you arrived because I know the things I should be able to accomplish and I don't want to do so. Now there's this kind of flashback Santiago has to the baker saying, it's good I refrained from saying anything to the baker and Tarifa, thought the boy to himself. So why is the merchant so hesitant here? He says, I know the things I should be able to accomplish. I don't want to do so. Is he afraid that of the failure? Or again, is he afraid of achieving something and then not having anything to do afterwards? Because up until Santiago... Before Santiago came, he was just very complacent. So now Santiago gets enough money. He leaves, goes back home. What's he going to do without Santiago there pushing him? Because it's kind of clear to me he hasn't really been able to push himself in that direction. You know what I'm saying? Like, Santiago was the good omen. Now the omen leaves, and he's left with all this responsibility. Just a thought. Uh, let's continue on. They keep talking. They um, they mention this word, maktub. Maktub means... Something like, it is written. Probably not a complete translation because he was saying that you sh you had to have been born Arab to understand, but roughly in your language, it's, it is written. So the crystal merchant ends up saying, you know, they can, they can start selling the tea. He gives in to the, to the boy's wishes sometimes. And there's the last word here before the, or sentence here before the page break. Sometimes there's just no way to hold back the river. <laughs> hey, follow up is king, as a famous, famous man once said. 
Um, I had this slide in here. Actually, I should have moved this slide to the end, but this is just some things that kind of appear again and again and again ever since we've met the Salem King. All these phrases and and wisdoms, lessons that the Salem King taught Santiago, they they come back and they repeat themselves. Like Santiago references them a lot, as we have just seen. But all of these, the beginner's luck, you know, that we were just talking about moments ago, you always got to know what you want. Never stop dreaming. Follow the omens. The universe conspires to help you achieve the thing that you want. All of these things, Santiago references all of these things. A lot. I mean, just here in 53 through 70, so I just had this slide here just kind of n- keeping notes on all the little um, phrases that that the Salem King had told them. Let's continue on a- after the page break. This is on page 61. Seems like the T, I think, is doing pretty well, too. Uh, before long, news spread and great many people began to climb the hill to, to see the shop that was doing something new in a trade that was so old. And then even more months and months, months pass by. um, Oh gosh, look at that. (laughs) I had a slide about it. So yes, Maktub, it is written. It is written on my slides. We just went over that. We are on page 62. More time has passed by at this page break. 11 months, 9 days passed since he first set foot in Africa. The, the boy is just waking up. Um, and this is kind of, like I was saying earlier, Santiago, he's starting to get more used to this land He's learned Arabic. He's be, he's beginning to be more accustomed to everything. It says here on page 62, he's dressed in Arabian clothing now. So it's no longer a strange land. Now it's it's the familiar land. Not home, but he's no longer kind of fearful of it as he once was. So in this time that has passed, Santiago reaches down, searches through his stuff, his pockets, pulls out a bundle of money. He sees that he now has enough money to buy those 120 sheep. He's got enough money to buy that ticket home and buy him money. This is interesting here. I don't know if this is will come into play later, but he's got enough money to license to import products back into Spain. So he informs the merchant that he is leaving. And this is a way to put in a two weeks notice. Santiago says, I'm leaving today. I got the money and you got the money to go to Mecca. Will you give me your blessing? But the guy says, You know, I'm going to give you your blessing, but you know I'm not going to Mecca. And you know that you are not going to buy your sheep. Who told you that, the boy said. And all the crystal merchant says is Maktub. It is written. So that's kind of interesting. Where exactly is that written? How does he know? It almost kind of seems like the crystal merchant in a way... is kind of acting a lot like the old the old man, the Salem king here. Like, you're not going. I already know that. Just, just like the Salem king knew all this information about Santiago, Santiago's left kind of breathless, like, how did this guy know all this stuff? Similarly, how does the crystal merchant know all... I shouldn't say all of it, but how does he know that Santiago isn't going to buy a sheep. Called his bluff. That's kind of impressive. (laughs) 
Let's continue on. Uh, Santiago, we got a page break. And then Santiago's starting to pack things up, starting to get prepared to leave. Santiago finds the omen stones again. Very interesting. This is on page 64. He finds the stones again. He has a strange sensation. The old king is nearby, he thinks. And he thinks that the omens are kind of telling him that he needs to go. It's time to leave the shop. Put in his two weeks. Leave on a high note. The, the crystal merchant is in good hands. He is successful now. But so, this is what the Salem king told them. You know, about the omens. About never stop dreaming, says right there on page 64. And then he thinks about his sheep. Because the sheep, he didn't really talk to the sheep, right? That's what he exclaimed, like the languages between him and the sheep. The sheep just kind of instinctually knew to follow him, trusted him like that. The sheep taught him there was a language in the world that everyone understood, a language that the boy had used throughout the time that he was trying to improve things at the shop. It was the language of enthusiasm, of things accomplished with love and purpose. And this is, this is what I was talking about earlier. Tangier was no longer a strange city, and he felt that just as he had conquered this place, he could conquer the world. And again, the quote from the Salem King, when you want something, the universe conspires to help you achieve it. So how do you think, you think Santiago had a, a lot of enthusiasm at the shop? I mean, he was gung-ho, hey, let's sell tea, hey, let's make this display case, hey, let's bring in more business. He's got a lot of enthusiasm for it, you know, because he has his own reasons for it. You know, he wants to get back to the country that he loves. He wants to get his sheep back, although it doesn't sound like he's going to get his sheep back, but he's got a perp. there's a purpose to what he's doing. And I think part of that purpose is helping the crystal merchant out as well. Because the crystal merchant has a personal legend, right? Has a personal legend that he has not achieved in the pilgrimage. So he's kind of taken what the Salem king told him, and now he's sharing it with the crystal merchant, although... You know, it sounds like the crystal merchant already kind of knows this stuff in a way. And as you see right here at this final point here on this slide, is the crystal merchant the old king? Because I was going to say, he kind of knows the things. He seems like he already knows everything that Santiago threw at him, the beginner's luck. It seemed like he kind of understood that you know he he understood that Santiago is not buying a sheep he understood about the purpose about about his personal legend although he hasn't achieved it he understands it what he needs to do what his personal legend is so I wrote here from page 65 He left without saying goodbye. He said that he always appeared right here. Okay, right here. It's almost as if he had been here and left his mark, he thought. And yet, none of these people has ever met the old king. On the other hand, he said that he always appeared to help those who are trying to realize their personal legend. And he's talking about the old king there. So that's why I wrote here is the merchant, the old king. You know, the, the king had a breastplate of gold. The merchant sells crystal. Probably very fine artifacts, silverware, glasses, dinnerware. Coincidence? Is there a connection there? Huh. It's 
kind of interesting. Let's continue on page 66. He says goodbye to the crystal merchant. And he kind of just leaves. And it seems like he's kind of having um, second thoughts about it. And he's kind of saying, well, maybe it's it's better to be like the crystal merchant. You never go, never go to Mecca. Don't travel. Don't realize your personal legend. You know why why? At least if if you never have accomplished it, it always gives you something to work for. He's kind of starting to think about that right there on page 66. But then he feels the powers of Urim and Thummim, those two omen stones. And he says that they had transmitted to him the strength and the will of the old king. And he finds himself at the bar he was at where he met that thief, the newcomer. Now he calls him a thief. And the owner brings him a cup of tea. And now, whereas earlier he was, it seemed like he was kind of having second thoughts. Now he's starting to think the the perspective is flipping. So he had second thoughts about um, traveling to the pyramids. He's thinking, okay, maybe I should just go home, take my sheep, pack it up, start anew. But now back at the bar, he's sipping on the tea. He's saying, okay, wait, wait, wait a second here. I might never get a chance to be this close to the pyramids. Everybody has told him, and this is what the thief told him too, that to get to the pyramids, you got to cross all that desert. It's going to take a long time, right? The merchant says the same thing. And the merchant also tells him how expensive it is. And what does the merchant tell him? Let me try to go back here because he tells him. He tells him that even if you cleaned my crystal for an entire year, even if you earned a good commission selling every piece, you would still have to borrow money to get to Egypt. And how long has he been working? I mean, he's been working here uh, with the crystal merchant almost a year. He's got enough money to buy 120 sheep. Don't you think he's got enough money to buy a ticket across the desert? Huh? So he's got this flip perspective. He's, he's still so far away from the pyramids, but he's two hours closer. Andalusia was two hours away. He's now two hours closer to his treasure. It's it's right across the desert. And it, the stones are starting to point him towards the pyramids. He held, this is on page 67, he held Urim and Thummim in his hand. Because of those two stones, he was once again on the way to his treasure. I am always nearby when someone wants to realize their personal legend, the old king had told them. And the boy remembers that there is a there's a warehouse that the crystal merchant utilized for supplies. Or rather, the crystal merchant had a supplier who had a warehouse. And the warehouse, out of that warehouse, they transported crystal by means of caravans. They transferred the crystal, maybe the the crystal merchant bought from there. Right. And then they would get shipped out. So it was kind of like a, like a hub, you know, like a FedEx hub. Well, where... 
else do they ship crystal from? Santiago points out they ship this crystal, not from, but where else do they ship crystal to? They ship it across the desert in these caravans. So now the boy's thinking, okay, I've got means, I've got the means to get across the desert. Why don't we go check out this supplier's warehouse? Let's find out how far these these pyramids really are. Let's see if we can utilize, you know, this caravan to get across the desert. Then we have a page break. And now we are met with an Englishman. Very interesting. He's sitting on a bench, bench in a structure that smelled of animal sweat and dust. It was part of a warehouse. So it kind of sounds like he's in the warehouse that the crystal merchant utilizes. And this Englishman, and I spelled this wrong, he's reading a chemical journal. And we find out some information about the Englishman. He studied a lot, world's religions. He studied Esperanto. I'm not really know what that is, but it sounds like a language. He, he knew how to speak Esperanto. But it seems like now he's trying to study alchemy. He's reading a book about it. He's asking, he said that he's, he's tried to get help from other alchemists, but they don't help him. And he's trying to figure out what what this uh, what's all about this uh, philosopher's stone he's trying to seek it out he's trying to get it that's what all these other alchemists are kind of trying to do as well he says it's interesting we're not really told what the philosopher's stone does really yet but it's just kind of thrown out there we're th- and we don't really know what this alchemy is i mean alchemy has to do with like uh, mixing metals, I think, like chemistry. Chem is chemistry, alchem, e. So something to do with like elements, metals, metallurgy, things like that. But it's not very clear yet. We don't really know much about this guy. Um, but he is in this warehouse because he's got to get. Um, across the desert or go into the desert because he thinks that's where he can find the very, very old Arabian, famous Arabian alchemist that's, again, in the middle of this desert at the Ol Fayum Oasis. And he's able to transform any metal into gold. And outside, there's a caravan ready to cross the Sahara, scheduled to pass through to Al-Fayyum. So it sounds like this is the warehouse that Santiago had mentioned before this page break. Hmm. Sounds like it. Because now... Santiago comes into the picture. Right at the bottom of 69, a young Arab, also loaded down with baggage, entered and greeted the Englishman. Where are you bound, asked the young Arab. I'm going into the desert, the man answered, turning back to his reading. He didn't want any conversation at this point. The young Arab took out a book and began to read. The book was written in Spanish. This young Arab is Santiago. The book in Spanish, remember Santiago's from Spain? This young Arab that the Englishman is referring to, because this is being kind of portrayed from the Englishman's perspective here, this is Santiago. He continues, he spoke Spanish better than Arabic, and if this boy was going to Al-Fayum, again, boy, Santiago, there would be someone to talk to when there were no other important things to do. So it's just kind of interesting. I have this. This is our final slide. The parallels between Santiago meeting the Englishman 
and the Salem king meeting Santiago. Because remember, when Santiago first came across the old man, the old man was interrupting him while he was reading. And now, Santiago comes into the picture with the Englishman, interrupts his reading, and, and, and the Englishman doesn't really want to talk to Santiago. <laughs> but next thing you know, the, the Englishman gets a little more interested because he now knows, like, okay, he knows how to speak Spanish. He, the Englishman speaks Spanish better than Arabic. He could have a buddy on this journey. Just kind of like Santiago when he first met the Salem King was very defensive. Didn't really want to talk to him. But then as the, the Salem King revealed information about Santiago, Santiago was perplexed, blown away. How can you, how can this guy know all this stuff about me? Then he became slightly more interested in it. And I think what we have here is the beginning of a journey. This guy, this character here that has entered into the picture sounds like Santiago. And it sounds like Santiago is going to join this caravan that goes across the desert. Follow the omens. <laughs> and I think that's what Santiago is doing. Where this Englishman comes into play, like finally we're starting to see some, some talk about alchemy from a book that's titled The Alchemist. I mean, we really haven't, besides uh, the preface or like that first like introduction, do you remember? We read that um, about uh, the story of Narcissus. Yeah, who is the Englishman? What's the tie here? What's the Philosopher's Stone? What's the purpose of that? Let's let's just keep reading and pray we find out. I think we will find out. Uh, for next time I wrote here, let's read pages 70 through 90. Right, that'll take us right through uh, the basically kind of halfway point of the book. More than halfway. A little more than halfway. Um, and we'll come back next week. We'll discuss 70 through 90. Think about... Think about the Salem King. And does the Salem King, can you, do you think that the Salem King has been with Santiago this entire time? As Santiago kind of explains, you know, he, he has the stones with him. And he says things like, oh, he feels the energy, you know, of, of the stones. He says that the, the old king told him, I'm always nearby. So has the Salem king never left his side? Think about that. It's interesting. The, the stones came from the Salem king's breastplate. So are they a part of him? It's interesting. The last we saw of the Salem king was he was on top of that high like plateau looking down on the city or town. But has he been with Santiago the entire time? Think about that for next time. Again, pages 70 through 90, and I will see you all next week. Thank you very much for listening. If you made it this far, my name is Chris. This is Chitash. Thank you, and see you next time.